again to Wonderful Wednesday in the Word. I'm your gracious host, Wesley T. Leonard, Senior Minister for the Southside Church of Christ here in the city of beautiful Orlando, Florida. What a privilege and a pleasure to address you again tonight from God's holy book, the Bible. Let's continue our inexhaustible quest and thirst to raise our biblical IQs to a point where it's more pleasing in the eyesight of the God we serve. We're so excited here at Southside with so many things going on. Uh, we're now in the month of October, and we'll be celebrating our fall festival on the 21st and 22nd. Come one, come all. What a great time that Saturday, the 21st. We'll be uh, having a food truck there with delectable meal, uh, snow cones, and uh, bounce houses, and face painting, and games, and etc etc you don't want to miss it uh, oh we're gonna have a game truck for the first time a big truck that you can go in with all kinds of video games etc it's the first time we'll have it at Southside you want to be there uh, one and all we want you to RSVP with our administrative office through our constant contact so we can make plans for you you and especially you and then on that Sunday morning we'll have at 9 a.m. we'll start promptly uh, a little earlier than Sunday school, yet Sunday only, a uh, skit and a play and other uh, deposits from our youth department and our education department 
showcasing our young people and the things they are learning and doing uh, to be good ambassadors and representatives of King Jesus. And uh, lest I forget, our guest and featured speaker uh, that weekend, that Sunday, will be Andrew Braxter uh, from the Rose City Community Church of Christ in Little Rock, Arkansas. Uh, what uh, is one of my sons in the gospel. Hadn't been to Southside in a while, but he will uh, be a tremendous blessing. Young man in his 30s, and I think he's more than capably qualified to be uh, address our youth and the whole church on that Sunday. So start galvanizing now, praying and uh, preparing for um, Fall Festival October 21st and 22nd. Now, beloved, tonight we continue our study of the parables of Christ. Uh, we'll probably be doing that the remainder of the year. It was so many. A parabolic proclamations our Lord made during his earthly ministry here on this celestial ball we call planet Earth. He, um, he taught in, in many methods, uh, in many ways, but parabolically or paradoxically uh, was his predominant ways. And again, a parable is an uh, earthly story connecting a heavenly meaning. It means to lay uh, a truth beside a story so you can elucidate it and clarify it and bring uh, uh, simplicity yet clarity at the same time. And so tonight, let's talk about the parable of the true vine, the parable of the story of the true vine. It is found in John the 15th chapter. You really need to read verses 1 through 17. Now remember on Wednesday night, uh, you have a homework assignments to read the entirety of the text. Uh, my job is to lift up from the pages a few salient points that will be helpful, useful, and beneficial to you as we all matriculate down Jacob's, uh, or climb Jacob's ladder together and down the highway of glory, uh, trying to make heaven our eternal home. So Jesus talked about this parable of the true vine, John chapter 15, verses 1 through 17. And he opens by talking about we should abide in him and he should abide in us. That word abide, stay, uh, stability, uh, no fluctuation, no ambiguity, abide in him. Uh, we got too many uh, vacillating Christians. So the story of the true vine, uh, a vine wraps itself around. It becomes interchangeable, inexhaustible in its surroundings. A vine, again, the verbiage the Lord used is contemporary with his time. Uh, they got their grapes and their wine from vines, grape vines. Uh, we, we now, I'm sure some of you young people don't even know what a vine is. I didn't say a vein, I said a vine. And a vine wraps itself around the poles and the woods and those in the garden that would bring it stability. He says, abide in him and he would abide in us. Uh, and when we stay with the Lord, when we abide with the Lord, when we are close to the Lord, we get his presence and we receive his power. Uh, we cannot rely on past experience. Abide. Stay in the church. Don't be in and out of the church or in and out of Christ. Don't rely on your past blessings or your past relationship. Abide. Each and every day, we ought to be renewed, refreshed, and revived in Christ. That's when we abide in Christ, we can walk in the Spirit. When we abide in Christ, we can pray in the Spirit. And when we abide in Christ, we can live in the Spirit. And when we do all those things successfully, we are certainly prepared for the bridegroom to come back and receive his church, which is the Church of Christ. We want to produce some fruit in our life. Two ways we grow, we produce fruit. We grow and mature our personal relationship with Christ, and then we inculcate that by winning others into the kingdom. Yes, we want to get people in, but don't forget about your personal growth, your personal development, your maturity, your modernity in Christ uh, should be congruent with us trying to get people in. I always tell people, sometimes I'm not trying to get more members, I'm trying to mature the members that we have. And that 
is uh, by encouraging and exalting, admonishing people to abide, stay strong, stay. Yeah, marriage ain't about getting married, it's about staying married. <laughs> you know, it, it's anybody can get something, but can you stay? Uh, the stability, the longevity. Uh, with, you see, uh, most of what you benefit in life, I'm at the age now, me and Sister Pam, we're starting to reach some benefits because of longevity. My wife worked on one job almost 40 years. I've been working since I was 17 years old. So you start, you ever notice when you have longevity, you start getting Social Security, retirement, Medicare, Medicaid. You start getting benefits, all comes because you stayed or you abided or longevity. Same thing in Christianity. If you can muster the fortitude to just hang on in there with God, even when it's tough, even when it's difficult, even when you feel like giving up, hang on in there. If you abide in him, he'll abide with you. If you sup with him, he'll sup with you, according to Revelation, and you reap all the benefits. So let's look tonight at uh, several umbrellas that this parable covers in his teaching. Uh, the true vine, okay? Uh, the true vine, he is expresses to us uh, that he is the vine and we are the branches. Okay, but if you don't produce any fruit, any grapes, he said, I don't have any use for you. And then he explains very pointedly that the husband man, we'll deal with that momentarily, has to prune the vines and the branches periodically. You cut away, you cut back so you can get more. Okay, we'll talk about that momentarily. So the first umbrella, we got five different umbrellas, ironically, under this parable, the caretaker, the cleanliness, the cooperations, the consecration, and the commission. It, it's not long, but it's exhaustive, but not, not terribly long. The caretaker in the text is um, God the Father and God the Son. Now notice what he says in verse 1 and 2. Uh, uh, my father, I am the, uh, the, the, my father is, I am the vine, my father talking about God, is the husband man. And the husband man is a caretaker. The, God the Father is the husband man. He's a caretaker. Uh, he takes care of us. Christ died for us, but it's God that takes care of us. Uh, and he explains in this process that for the caretaker to do his job, sometimes, and I teach this all over the country, Sometimes God got to hurt you, but he'll never harm you. The pruning process is never pleasant. See, e even the guys that do my flowers out of my yard, they, they cut back, whether it's azaleas or other, they cut it back a certain time of the year so it can flourish and grow later in the year. You see, so what God does, and sometimes you get even in the church, well, where the people? I, I'm not always concerned about where the people are. Sometimes God's pruning his church. God is the only one who can add by subtracting. That's pruning. You see, see, you concentrate on numbers. And no, sometimes God says, I, less means more. Okay? And so the husband man, that's God. He's the caretaker. That's God. Christ is the vine. We are the branches. But God is the husband man. He does those things in the garden. And that can be found also not only in John 5, 1 and 2, but Proverbs 3, 11 and 12, God is the husband man. Appreciate the pruning process in your life. Those times when God is cutting back, God is pruning things in your life, getting rid of things in your life so you can grow more effectively and grow more efficiently in the future. Not only does the Bible talk in this working parable about the caretaker. Remember, John chapter 15, verse 1 to 17, uh, the true vine. He is the vine, we are the branches. God is the husband man. He talks about the cleanliness in this parable. How the vine should remain pruned and pretty and pristine and productive. Uh, the cleanliness as found in John chapter 15, verse number 3. And we need to cleanse as children of God. He's encouraging us, admonishing us to cleanse our actions. That can be found in Galatians 5, 16. Christians ought to cleanse our actions. You know, the older you get, the wiser you get, 
uh, the cleaner you ought to live. Now, that's not always true. I think all of us struggle in our department of struggle. But we want to cleanse our actions, walk in the Spirit as He is in the Spirit. We walk by faith and not by sight. Not only do we cleanse our actions, we need to cleanse our attitudes, according to Proverbs 23 and 7. Uh, you can't do right if you don't think right. Your attitude adjustment. I'm praying that God will continue to adjust my attitude, the way I look at things, the way I view things, the way I talk about things, the way I act. My actions won't be right. You don't do right until you think right. What's your attitude or your feelings about that? Ask God to cleanse your attitude along with your actions. The better your attitude, the more productive your actions will be. And then not only that, that's God in the text. He sees there's a sincere point here. God can control not only our actions, but our character. Your character is what you do when nobody's around. Your character is the real meaning and substance of who you are. Uh, I, I'm growing and praying for you, and you pray for me. Let's pray for another. We be people of character. Let your yeas be yea and your nays be nay. Your character uh, will be on full display, whether church folk are around or whether you're around secular people. Your character is what you do when nobody but you and God know what you're doing. So we want to cleanse our actions. We want to walk in the spirit. We want to cleanse our attitudes. We want to control our actions and our character. And, and then we want, under this umbrella of cleanliness, we want to cleanse our affections. Uh, we want to grow to love things that God loves and hate things that God hates. Uh, 1 Corinthians 13, our daily love walk with God will lead us to a place and a time uh, that we just learn to love what God loves. We hate what God hates. We're close to what God's close to. We are far away from what God's far away from. That comes with modernity and maturity and time. So we want to cleanse ourselves, cleanse our actions, our attitude, control our character, our principles. And we want to fall in love with the things that Christ falls in love with. And we'll control and cleanse our affections. And thirdly tonight, the cooperation in the text. It's, it's a dependent text. It requires for a corporate relationship for things to happen. So now it took three working parts, the vine, the branches, and the husband man. See, the church and the family and business and society and jobs and corporations work not with one entity or two. There are several moving parts. For the, for the vineyard to produce grapes and to be productive, efficient and effective, it required cooperation. Vine, branches, husband, man, soil, fertilizer, water. You see, nowhere in the church can a congregation of God's people flourish with one or two entities working independent. We work interdependent one to another. We abide in him. That means, and he in us, and we with one another. That's fellowship. 1 John chapter 1, verse 7. That's the cornea the church must have. We do this. We are in this thing together. I can preach. You can sing. You can pray. You can greet. You can lead women. You can lead men. You can galvanize our youth. We all are part of the food ministry, the men's ministry, the women's ministry. We all galvanize to help those who are disenfranchised. We all galvanize to invite people, to teach people, to baptize people. We are interdependent, not independent, in the church. It requires corporation. Uh, it, it, you see it in the text. Notice vines and and branches are so close you can't separate them. They're they're combined. And then the husband man, God, is the one that does the pruning. He he you gotta have somebody watching all that, watching over it. That's why the Bible says he's the great shepherd. 
That's why God gave us local shepherds. They're called elders, but their function is to be a shepherd. Notice the church don't work with the, the preacher, the evangelist, that's me, working with shepherds and elders. That's Brother Crumity and Brother Davis and, and, and hopefully soon Brother Moses. And then those 12 deacons, like Deacon Peterson, who's here with me tonight, work together. We have to work together with the membership. To get things done, it requires cooperation. And when solo acts come to the church, they're solo people, they want to fly by themselves. No, this story reminds us that cooperation is needed in the church. Dependence, uh, not only on God, but with each other and for each other. That's why Jesus declared in his gospel, without me, you can do nothing. But he said, but with me, you can do everything. I do all things. Philippians 4.19, you know, I can do all things uh, through Christ. Why? He gives me strength. And so, beloved, uh, without him, without dependence, working together, we're nothing by ourselves. With him and with others in the church, we can do all things. And so not only we see the caretaker in the text, that's the husband man, God, working with Christ to keep us straight. Not only we see the cleanliness in the church, nothing like a dirty, weed-infested God. God keeps the garden clean, and subsequently, he's talking about keeping us clean, pruning us, cleaning us so we can be more productive. Sometimes that cleanliness is not pleasant. Sometimes God's got to hurt us, but he will never, ever harm us. And then the text talks about, the parable talks about cooperation, the interwoven nature of a vine and branches in a vineyard and how they're inseparable, inconquerable together. And that's how the church is, we're inseparable. We work together for the good of the kingdom and we are, are dependent upon God and each other to get kingdom business done. So not only the corporation in the text, and, and you remember now when you're not productive, you're not productive, uh, then we again cast out as fire into the outer of darkness. Uh, we are good for nothing, and God will have to uh, leave us in eternity, uh, weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. And then the text talks about the consecration in the text. Uh, he's talking about prayer and supplication. Our power comes from our prayer. Our pleasure comes from our power. Uh, what we produce. Listen, there's all kind of peas in here. Prayer, power, pleasure, and produce. Uh, we, God doesn't, you, you got to produce in the end. You got to replicate. Uh, that's the consecration. But for that to happen, there's some things got, you got to prune, you got to cut, you got to fertilize, you got to till the ground, you got to turn over the ground. You, Jeremiah 33 and 3 will help us with that. The consecration factor of the vineyard. It's right there in the text. <clears throat> God doesn't want any and everything happening. There ought to be some sanctification and consecration uh, set aside. Uh, 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 the vineyard don't produce apples and it don't produce pears. You see, it produces grapes. And too many churches are trying to produce things God not, doesn't want us to produce. We ought to be laser focused on kingdom business. And don't get me wrong, I'm not against churches doing this and doing that. But I think sometimes the church is too broad in its mission and we lose focus on the main thing. We ought to keep the main thing the main thing. Don't major in minors and don't minor in majors. Concentrate and concentrate and concentrate our efforts, energies, on kingdom business. And lastly, in this same parable tonight, the commission. We are called in the latter part of John 15 to go out and expand the vineyard, the garden, uh, bring more branches in. See, we already got a, a, a vine, we just need more branches. Branches would, would sprout from the vine and just start wrapping around and wrapping around. And God is sitting there overseeing and superintending the whole of human affairs. And so God is saying, grow my vineyard. He, it's always amazing, everything about the church, God wanted us to replicate and duplicate and expand and grow. 
and John 3.16. Why? God loved the world, so we ought to love the world. Uh, this was manifested by Christ's death on the cross. He died for us so we can live for him and show our mythology of love and care and concern for the lost. Expand the vineyard. That's our commission, Matthew 28, 18 and 20. Our commission, go into a dying and lost world. Expand the vineyard. The Lord does not want the vineyard to be the same size when he get back there as he left. Yes, we ought to love people and sinners that we want to win the lost. Mark 16 and 16 through 20. Uh, yes, every commission and command we had was on expansion, explosion, on the vineyard to grow. And sometimes God had to cut back so that the vineyard can grow. And that's what he's really talking about the church. The people and things he had to get rid of who were hindering the process and the progress. Some churches are pregnant with possibility, but it cannot grow with the same people you got there. God did that as a principle in the Old Testament. When they left Egypt land of bondage and went through the Red Sea. But before he took them to Canaan, the promised land, they were in the wilderness 40 years around Mount Seir. It's an 11-day trip that took 40 years. And God explained, the reason why I didn't let y'all go in, I had to wait on all them aliens to die to come out of Egypt. Only two people that, out of the millions that came out of Egypt, only two went into the promised land of Canaan, Joshua and Caleb. And incidentally, they were the two positive spies that Moses said on a reconnaissance stealth mission to spy out the promised land. Yeah, sometimes God waits on things to die. He'll cut it back himself. He'll take, allow us to take two steps back so we can make five steps forward. It's an interesting dynamic of the true vine, the interwovenness, the, the closeness of the vine to the branches, always under the superintendent nature of the husband man, which is God. The caretaker, God, is in this parable. The cleanliness, the purging, is in this text. The cooperation uh, uh, is in this text uh, that we need all hands on deck, all members involved. The consecration, the cutting back is in this text. And the commission to grow the vineyard. If you're close to God and close to you, bring others into this wonderful, marvelous fellowship. So let it be written, so let it be done. The grass withers, the flower fadeth away. But the words of our God shall stand forever. The parable of the true vine. Let us pray tonight. Father, we're mindful, glad, and happy of this opportunity to share your word and like faith with those who are listening tonight. Help us to be more like you would have us to be. Help us to be interwoven, intertwined with your son Jesus, always under the watchful, careful eye of you who purge and cleanse us and consecrate us and sends us to grow your vineyard. Bless us to do that at Southside and many places beyond. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Beloved, continue to pray one for another. Again, there's so many maladies and disease and uh, infirmities uh, that's infiltrated our church. Uh, but continue to pray one for another, help one another, aid, assist, and comfort one another on this journey from earth to glory. For any reminder, be there Sunday, this Sunday at 10 a.m. for Bible classes for all ages, 11 a.m., morning worship service live promptly at 11 if you can't be there we want you to be there many of you our crowds have expanded uh, enormously in the last month or two and we're glad about that keep coming but if you can't be there watch us on facebook live stream or youtube live stream and you know at that time they go into perpetuity in the archives and you can go back and refer to them anytime god bless you tonight god keep you this is our prayer what a joy and a privilege to talk to you tonight about the parable of the true vine. Good night.